good afternoon. Uh, my name is Max Wallace, um, a long-time member of the NZIRH. I'm also the secretary of the Rationalist Association of New South Wales, established in 1912. And I'm here with my wife, Meg, who is the president of the Rationalist Association of New South Wales and also a long-term member of NZARH. And on the platform with me today is Kim Stanton, and we're going to share the talk. We've got 20 minutes, and we'll get through it. And uh, I'd like to invite Kim to speak first. Uh, kia ora, everyone. You OK hearing me? Yeah. So this is a talk about Fiji. Uh, I'm speaking today uh, just to help Max out and on behalf of a, a Fijian colleague uh, who was going to be speaking here today. Fiji has a population of about 900,000 scattered across some 300 islands. Like all Pacific islands, it's been subject to intense missionary activity since the 19th century. Now, according to the 2007 census, about 65% of the population were Christian. Of those, 38% called themselves Methodist, 28% called themselves Hindu, 6% Muslim, and only 1% of Fijians said that they had no religion. A comment by an Australian tourist about the Cook Islands could equally apply to Fiji. He said that on a 35-kilometre bike ride around Rarotonga, which is the main island in the Cooks, he found 23 separate factions of various Pentecostal, Evangelical and Protestant sects before he gave up and lost count. A recent survey of over 1,000 students at the University of South Pacific in Fiji found that more than 80% attended church at least weekly. But there is a significant gap between the oppression of pious religious belief in Fiji and actual behaviour. This infers that the Christian teaching of common morality has failed in Fiji as it has elsewhere. In 2016, the Prime Minister, Frank Baina Rama, appealed to all citizens to stop the abuse of women and children because charitable organisations have reported that they have so many unwanted babies left at their residences that they can no longer cope with them. A 2017 Global Health School survey found high drug and alcohol abuse and early sexual activity amongst young teenagers. Almost half of children under the age of 14 have consumed alcohol and drugs and had sex. So the stats were that 49% of students said they'd consumed alcohol before the age of 14. 57% of students admitted to having drugs before they were 14, and 48% had already had sex by the time they were 14, 12% had smoked. It would appear that these inappropriate behaviours are having a secularising effect. Just last week, a government minister was cited in the Fiji Times saying that, in his view, children are losing interest in religious education and knowledge. But there is also a lot of superstition. In 2016, thousands of people drove to a river which was alleged by the locals to have healing waters. Of course, it was a scam to attract revenue to the impoverished village. But in an article in the Fiji Times, the Catholic Archbishop of Suva said that he had driven to the healing waters to bathe his knee to help its recovery after a recent operation. In the first Fijian coup in 1987, the coup leaders split from Fiji's colonial status as a British constitutional monarchy and became a republic. In 2013, a new constitution was written which formally separated government and religion. And we'll return to that. Samoa. <clears throat> the population of Samoa is much less than Fiji, only about 200,000 people. In 2016, the government announced it would make the Methodist Church the established church of Samoa. At our suggestion, IHEU raised the matter in the UN our thanks to Elizabeth O'Casey for her help in protesting this, but they went ahead and did it anyway. But in a revealing twist, the supposedly theocratic government has introduced a law that requires ministers of religion to register with the government and declare their incomes for the purposes of taxation. It was supported by the nation's feisty newspaper, the Samoa Observer, whose editor has publicly said Samoa is riddled with corruption. The media are effectively the opposition. They published this letter to the Samoa Observer on 5 July this year. If ministers of religion do not want to pay tax, perhaps they should stop accepting money altogether on Sundays. Then we will see whether they are in the job for the right reason. <laughs> Congregational Christian church ministers of religion get their food provided for them. They get their power and water bills paid. Many of them get cars gifted to them by the church 
which many are allowed to take with them once they retire. They have houses provided for them by the church parish. When they retire, many ministers of religion leave with huge gift payments, which many Samoans can only dream of. Some of the most expensive cars in the country are owned by ministers of religion. So why the need to accept money every week? Running up lists of property assets and trust funds for your kids is not the reason for Jesus' calling. In fact, I would say all those earthly riches corrupt the mission of the church with many ministers of religion picking and choosing which church they go to and serve depending on how many members they have. The higher the number, the more money they make. Well, the Minister for Revenue has met the consequent storm of protest about his tax from the religious with defiance, saying this. We have the power and authority to seize funds from the personal bank accounts of ministers of religion. The government will go after their personal assets, their personal belongings, such as houses and vehicles, and anything that is of value, we will seize. However, at the same time the Minister for Revenue was claiming the high moral ground on this matter, Samoa also acts as a tax haven for first world investors seeking to conceal their money. Some $230 million in aid from atheist communist China has been accepted by the devout Methodist government. United Nations investigators have gone to Samoa to investigate rising levels of violence against women. The number of recorded cases rose to 723 in 2015 from 200 in 2012, prompting a year-long national inquiry. A Ministry of Health report that abortion should be legalised met total rejection. Same-sex marriage has been ruled out. A Samoan, now exiled in Australia, wrote that, a Polynesian atheist or free thinker is, I suggest, a much braver individual. He or she is thick-skinned warrior to stand defiantly against the docile citizenry who will never accept the fact that they have been conquered by the white man. They conform to the trappings and symbols of religious assimilation by wearing the whites every Sunday as an act of racial contrition to a white preacher man's own contrived rules. The Samoan goes meekly to his or her church in the middle of the village and is deeply humbled by the Beatitudes and acknowledges that they are truly conquered. Samoa is in a bad place. But so long as this free speech continues, there's some hope. Tonga. The population of Tonga is only about 100,000 people scattered over many islands. The census of 2011 found that 90% of the population were affiliated with a Christian church or sect. Roughly a third were Methodist, a third Catholic, and a third Mormon. Tonga has a monarchy that's unique in the Pacific. The Methodist church is the established church. The royal family of the country are prominent members. Political life is dominated by the Tongan king, 33 nobles, and a few prominent commoners. New Zealand QC, Nigel Hampton, who was Tonga's Chief Justice from 1995 to 1997, said Tonga's 33 noble families have huge influence because they control the land leases. He said, that in itself leads to the possibility of payments being made or favours expected. The Legislative Assembly of Tonga is comprised of 17 members elected by the people and nine members elected by the nobles. And in 2008, Forbes magazine found Tonga to be the fifth most corrupt nation on earth. Tongan politicians and public servants have been involved with the sale of Tongan passports, which facilitate drug smuggling. The government seems powerless to do anything about it. Nigel Hampton QC said cabinet ministers had absolute control of their ministries and were in charge of appointing their own staff, which left the door open for corruption. A 2016 survey has found that 77% of women there have been physically or sexually abused. The Minister for Internal Affairs said about 90% of such incidents were carried out by husbands, by fathers and teachers. Despite these facts, it was reported in 2017 that Tonga, along with other UN, mem UN members, being Iran, Sudan, Somalia and the USA, had not ratified the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. In Tonga, homosexuality is illegal, punishable by 10 years jail, but it's rarely enforced as there is ongoing tolerance, except from Christian, mission, Christian missionaries, of the whakaleiti. This is a third gender which functions for families that happen to have no female children or a significant gender imbalance. Whakaleiti means like a lady. A male child aged between three and five 
is given the option of being a girl and learning to fulfill traditional female duties in the home, such as weaving, cooking, cleaning, childcare, and so on. Large whakalaiti Tongan men who choose this option as children now dress up in mini skirts and makeup and go to clubs where they mix. They are considered to be homosexual, but heterosexual men who have sex with them do not consider themselves as homosexual. So, in pious Tonga, there is financial corruption and curious sex. So one might ask, is Tonga a microcosm of what religion is actually all about? Okay, uh, I'll briefly discuss New Zealand by returning to where we started, Fiji. In 2017, my wife Meg had this letter published in the New Zealand Herald. The threat of continuing earthquakes must give the government pause for thought as to whether they should grant a substantial $10 million public money for the rebuild of Christchurch Cathedral. Another reason for not granting the $10 million, so far not contemplated, comes from Fiji. After Cyclone Winston devastated the Fiji Islands, the church has asked for government money to help them rebuild their many damaged churches. Prime Minister Frank Banimarama won't have it. He said churches and their communities are capable of financing their own repairs. He said citizens' homes and damaged infrastructure was the government's priority. He pointed out that the Republic of Fiji is a secular state and it is not the government's job to rebuild any house of religion in Fiji. But New Zealand is not a republic. It does not have a constitution declaring that it is secular with a section separating government from religion, as does the 2013 Fijian constitution. Surprisingly, Sir Geoffrey Palmer's new draft constitution does not include a, separate, a section separating government from religion. Why not? I believe the comment from the Fijian Prime Minister that the Fijian government would not use government money to fund religion is the most progressive secular thing that any politician has said in this part of the world in the last 200 years. There is con considerable entanglement of government with religion in New Zealand through the subsidy of religious schools, the acceptance of religious instruction and chaplains in public schools, tax exemptions and straight out grants of money. Symbolically, the national anthem is the appalling Christian hymn, God Defend New Zealand. The parliamentary speaker recently changed the prayer in parliament, but he was too timid to get rid of it altogether. Abortion has not been decriminalised. Blasphemy is still a crime, but it is finally under review after decades of delay. In a recent article, MP David Seymour, speaking to his end-of-life choices bill, soon to be before the Parliament, said that New Zealand does not have a written constitution that is above Parliament, so, quote, so no court can enforce a law change. That is exactly right. In my view, uh, New Zealand government is a kind of parliamentary tyranny. And I've written an article about this. My critical views in, are, are in an article out on the, on the desk outside. Now, finally, um, on behalf of my uh, Australian colleagues, we would like to congratulate the NZ, uh, NZHS and the NZARH for bringing this conference to New Zealand, putting Australia to shame. We'll acknowledge the good work that Sarah Passmore, Tanya Jacobs, David Hines and Peter Harrison especially, are doing to advance the secular cause in New Zealand. Finally, Meg's book. We have a few copies available for the low secular price of $20. This is a legal treatise uh, which uh, uh, explains how uh, Article 18 has been misinterpreted to favour religion when it should be promoting equality between beliefs. Thank you. And thank you, Kim.